and this is I Will Fight You, a podcast where we've been turning the f- Hey there, Internet. I'm Annie. I'm Kit. And I'm Mac. And welcome to I Will Fight You, a podcast where we've been turning opinion into fact since 1986. This is our inaugural episode, folks, and uh, we are brought to you by our generous Patreon supporters. Please, 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 we hope you like this. Every episode, we will be presenting a cold, hard fact from yours truly's? How do you pluralize that? And showing you exactly why this opinion must, in fact, be correct. Uh, be warned that these opinions are mostly going to be about cartoons, games, and movies from the 80s and maybe some towards today. What can I say? We like old garbage. So, ladies and gentlemen, first off, for those of you who are listening to us from the Gem Jam, which is probably most of you, we will be warning you ahead of time. This is a PG-13 podcast, so prepare for more swear words. And discussions of a sexual and otherwise inappropriate nature. We might talk about sex a little more. They, they do... People. People having... I'm interlacing my fingers here, and I don't think it's coming across very well. Yeah, I can see your eyebrows in my mind's eye. Today's fact we will fight you over is that The Swan Princess, the 1994 animated film, can only be enjoyed by people under 6 and over 25. Cold hard fact. So a little bit of background on this movie. Uh, first off, The Swan Princess is directed by a man called Richard Rich. He also wrote and produced it. Richard Rich was a Disney animator who left shortly before the Disney Renaissance began. He directed The Fox and the Hound, and he co-directed The Black Cauldron, so make of that what you will. Of course, he also went on to produce and direct produce the sequels to Alpha and Omega, a.k.a. the CGI Sparkle Wolf movie. They have emo haircuts. Watch it sometime. The great thing about Alpha and Omega is that its own fan fiction starts in the movie and is the B-plot. This is a movie based on Swan Lake, the ballet. Very loosely based. What you need to know about Swan Lake is that the basic story is that Prince Siegfried meets a woman and her sisters or other maidens who can turn from swans into ladies. They have all been cursed by a man named Von Rothbart. Siegfried and Odette, the maiden with which he falls in love, you know, they kind of have ballet sex. There's a pas de deux in there. Except then Von Rothbart gets wise to this and he sends his either assistant or daughter, depending on the version you're in, named Odile to tempt the prince away. Uh, Odile is often played by the same dancer that does Odette, so there's a bit of a thing in there. And then he pledges to marry Odile, then he realizes that it's not Odette, and then they basically both jump into the lake, the swan lake, if you will, and drown, and depending on your version, ascend to heaven as lovers reunited. It's ballet. That's about par for the course with ballet. If you want to see that, but like Maho Shoujo, you can watch Princess Tutu, which is really good. Or if you just want to see that, but want to kind of see it rubbed all over the floor, then you can watch Swan Princess. You can watch this movie. We watched this movie. This movie is basically to Swan Lake what Frozen is to the Snow Queen. Slightly more faithful an adaptation than Frozen was to the Snow Queen. My relationship with it is I loved it, um, but you know those big old vans that grandparents always seem to have when you're a kid that actually have the VCR in them? My grandma and grandpa had one, and there were only two movies in it. One was Space Jam, and the other was Swan Princess. Oh, a connoisseur. This explains so much about you as a person. It was like 12 hours straight of Space Jam and Swan Princess. Come on and slam, and welcome to the Swan Princess. Welcome to the princesses on parade. Oh, no. And I do remember at one point taking it out so that I could watch it in the house, and then forgetting it for years so that Space Jam became the only movie in the van. Is this another thing, like with Jem, where our rediscovery of it as adults was a mutual thing? I, I do dimly remember at one point we were flipping through Netflix, and we saw Swan Princess, and we both got giddy and watched it. Yeah, my I, Swan Princess, uh, I think mine was more similar to Kid. It was a movie that I remembered really liking when I was a kid. I think I had some of the Happy Meal toys. I was a really big fan of it. And then I just sort of grew out of it and got older. And then I sort of rediscovered it. Like Mackenzie and I were, were looking through things and I was like, you know what? I get the feeling that the Swan Princess would be really hilarious to watch now that I'm older. And we agreed. And then it happened. And now I'm like obsessed with this garbage. It's such a thing that at uh, Annie's uh, bridal party, uh, we, we watched it that night. 
Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, the, the bridal shower after party was, let's watch the Swan Princess. And bake cookies. <laughs> it was a pretty good night. Okay, what about you, Kip? Uh, this was one of those movies that as a tiny child, I was obsessed with. Like, this was one of the ones where we wore out the VHS tape. My brother and I watched it so much. Having seen it now as an adult, I feel like I owe my parents an apology. So, all that aside, let's get into the prologue of this movie. There's a narration... I've written it down verbatim because it's so weird. Once there was a king named William who ruled a large and mighty kingdom. Don't bother remembering that detail because this movie doesn't. And yet he was very sad because he was growing old and had no child to inherit the throne. And then a nurse emerges from a room. He's, he's pacing in front of a balcony and a nurse emerges from another room and hands him a bundle. Then, happily, a daughter was born. A daughter was born. Not even William's daughter was born. This could be some random child he stole. There's just a nurse. There's no wife. There's no mother. No mother is ever mentioned. He just loves that this daughter was born. And then he freaking Lion Kings this baby off the balcony. A princess. And she was given the name... Odette. Kings and queens came from all around to offer their gifts to the child. Among them was the widow, Uberta, and her young son, Prince Derek. Not Queen Uberta, the widow Uberta. This is also forgotten later in the movie. She is a widow Uberta, and she has a son named Prince Derek. Generally, this would make Uberta the queen. And the movie calls her queen later. This is worth noting that we have our first view of Prince Derek, who is Siegfried in, uh, in this movie. And he is wearing the exact same clothes that he will wear for the rest of his life. Odette goes through like three or four outfit changes in this movie, and Derek only has two outfits. And one of them is a fancier version of his basic one. <laughs> it's a slight palette swap and it adds like a cape. And here's where it starts to go off the deep end. It was then that William and Uberta happened upon the same idea. Which is weird because it's a dumb idea. And it's really specific. Derek and Odette would be brought together each summer in hopes that they would fall in love and join their kingdoms forever. Never mind that as king and queen, they could just be like, well, looks like our two kids are engaged now. Arranged marriages. Arranged marriages. And the thing is that, like, during this little bit of the narration, it shows William and Uberta just sort of like, hmm? They look at each other and they start nodding. And, and to me, it's like, what if instead of this big, long, specific idea, it was, what if they f***ed? Oh man, they should f***. They should totally f***. Oh my god, this is my OTP now! They ship it. They ship it to a terrifying degree. This whole first musical number is devoted to how uncomfortable this is. Yeah, it's basically Derek and Odette will be forced to spend every summer together until they fall in love or one of them kills the other. Either way, somebody gets a kingdom. But unknown to everyone was another plan. That of the evil enchanter, Rothbart. Odette's birth was of little concern to him. For he was planning to take William's kingdom by means of the Forbidden Arts. You can just hear the capital letters. The Forbidden Arts are basically him dropping stuff into cauldrons and making sparkly colored lights. Did you know? There's a whole Swan Princess wiki, and there is an analysis of the Forbidden Arts as laid out in the Swan Princess sequels. Did you know further? The Forbidden Arts itself, as an amorphous blob, is the bad guy along with some talking flying squirrels in the most recent Swan Princess sequel where they adopt a little girl. On the eve of his assault, William attacked and Rothbart's powers were plunged into darkness. Which is basically accomplished by, like, the guy from Dragon's Lair kicking over his cauldron. He is the guy from Dragon's Lair! Thank you all you noticed that! The soldiers have a very Bluthian design. Despite calls for his death, the Enchanter was only banished. And then we take a quick break and we have the first, like, real line in the movie, which is Rothbart. It's like, someday I'll get my power back. And when I do, everything you own, everything you love, will be mine. It's worth noting that Rothbart's voice actor is Jack fucking Palance. Jack Palance is an Oscar-nominated actor who died a couple of years ago, and basically from, like, 1960 onwards, if there was a bad mafia guy in a movie, it was Jack fucking Palance. That explains so much about how weird and, like, raspy and over-enunciated Rothbart's voice is. Yeah, so basically what you need to know about this movie, if you have not seen it, is that you need to hear all of Rothbart's lines in the voice from evil mob boss from 
the Batman movie in 1989. Oh my god. Oh my god. How does this movie just keep getting better? And Rothbard's like, someday I'll get my power back and it will never be explained how or why. Uh, actually... Oh no, you're gonna tell me it was explained in a sequel. It was explained in The Swan Princess 3. There was a lady involved. I only know this because I was trying to figure out what the hell the Forbidden Arts is. Many feared William too kind, but over time the threat was forgotten, and all hopes turned to that distant summer when Derek and Odette would meet. It's important to know about this scene that the happy music cue on, on Derek and Odette will meet, which starts way too early. It starts while Rothbard is stalking away into the woods. So we have the main villain stalking off to get his revenge, and then like this happy little music over top of La la la, sha la 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 la. So, that distant summer later, we fade into an awful gremlin in a neck ruff who cackles and prances on top of a castle. I was about to call him the creepy bard guy, but that sounds better. I also like that! I think he is referred to as the Chamberlain, but I have him in my notes as just the gremlin. We are at Uberta's castle. And we're starting a song called My Idea of Fun, I think? I think it's just This Is My Idea. I Look, by the time the credits roll around and it's actually showing you what the names of the songs are, or I I can't. You're you're too distracted by the '90s power ballads over the credits. There's a '90s power ballad, guys. Get ready for it. So, Uberta and Derek are here. They're just meeting William and Odette on the frickin' lawn on a dirt road. William and Odette have maybe been riding horseback and riding on a boat for, like, at least a day. They haven't got a chance to change clothes or sit down. Odette's not even in her own saddle. She's sitting on her dad's saddle. Why is there no carriage? Doesn't this sort of, like, thing happen in at least, like, a throne room or, or, or a receiving chamber? A good thing to also note here is, um, we're about to see a bunch of facets of Odette that will not be explored later in the movie. Yeah, she loses all interesting elements of her character the moment she gets hot. Well, I would say the same thing happens to Derek, but he didn't really have anything to start with. And this whole sequence is get ready for heteronormativity, the movie. Right before the song starts, Derek and Odette are like maybe six years old each, maybe seven. Boys are gross, they have cooties. Girls are gross, they have cooties. Whatever. Derek and Odette are shoved together to say hi, he has to kiss her hand, it's this whole thing. And then the song immediately just sort of rolls in with, he looks conceited, what a total! bummer! There's no pretense of historically accurate dialogue in this thing. And I mean, we're about to see the next 10 years of these kids' lives, at least, and their parents are the pushiest people about them getting married, and it's it's really uncomfortable. I always hate this thing where adults will force heterosexuality onto small children. The worst thing about it happening in this movie is that it f***ing works. And not to mention it also has one of those really uncomfortable tones of like, haha, ah, oh, they're fighting, oh, boys will be boys. I will note that there's a really great line in this song where the commoners are talking about why they want these two to get married. And one of the lines in there is, and with some luck their marriage will result in lower taxes. Mad props for working that into a song in a children's movie. Although Oh, this is also the same song that rhymes seasick with bee sick. Look, this song's a bit hit or miss. Okay, so let's let's quickly run by all these little time skips that we have because we have about four here. In the first one, they're little kids, they're sword fighting and uh, punching each other while the parents are singing about how good this idea is. Derek's choking Odette in the background and then Odette punches him in the face. It's maybe the best part. Then like Derek and his chubby friend Bromley uh, hit her with a tomato. Tween Odette has murder in her her eyes. Every peasant is really into these guys getting married. Is this what it's like to be British? So then we have another time skip. Teen Odette and Derek. I think this is the one that's my favorite version of Odette what? because it's like she tries to talk Derek in plain dress up and she's always flirting with the castle guards. What happens to flirty Odette? I want flirty Odette back the rest of the movie. I want the one who has a sword and will beat Derek with it. She's flirty, she chats, she's very clever, she wins at cards, and she's also reading a lot. This seems like a combination of hobbies and interests that would make for an interesting character. But no. Derek, meanwhile, is still exactly the same. He just got taller. This is when we uh, splash the peasants and they're doing some dramatic things with the backgrounds, but then we come up to King William writing a letter to Queen of Bird and he's like, what if Odette doesn't go for the merger? Urge her! Why not just make this an arranged marriage? Why not just sign a contract instead of this weird, passive-aggressive, pushy crap? Also, merger and urge her. Well, that's at least better than seasick and be sick Marginally. This is our final Final flash forward. Where they're like, for as long as I remember, uh, we've been told we'd be wed, don't like the other one, and then they're finally shoved into the same room together, and everything goes sparkly. Bye! 
boners! It's like, oh no, she's hot. Oh no, he's hot. And they just like, I see things and my knees start buckling. I see inside him and my doubts are gone. She started out as such an ugly duckling. And somehow suddenly became a swan. Do you see what Derek did there? Somehow she became a swan. Yeah, she wasn't an ugly duckly to begin with. Where the hell have you been, Derek? And so as soon as these kids like approach each other, it's like everyone else barges into the room with like caterers and music and the king and queen. It's like sound the freaking alarm. Get these two horny kids married immediately. Now the operative word for this movie, and it's readily apparent in the sequence and all that follow, is teeth. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just the fact that, like, most faces Derek makes are these big, wide-open mouths with, like, this big line of teeth. Then there's Rogers, who is, like, the musician, or I think he's supposed to be the same character as the tutor in Swan Lake. And he's, like, he has individually drawn teeth. It's really creepy. <laughs> There's so much teeth in this movie. And then these two teethy young morsels uh, start doing the Cinderella dance. They dance in a pink void. And, and it's one of those, like, semi-homage traces directly over the ballroom dancing shot in Cinderella. And then they kiss, and Derek's filthy man paws end up on Odette's hair. Don't touch that, it's better than you. And after this little face-mashing, Derek is like, arrange the marriage! And then Odette's like, what? You're all I've ever wanted! You're beautiful! Thank you, but what? What else? What else? Is beauty all that matters to you? And Odette's dad is like, shut up, Odette! And then Derek's like, what else is there? Wah, wah. Shut it down! This is, this is now how arranged marriages work, apparently. Shut the whole thing down, everybody goes home, and Uberto wanders to the hall shouting, all these years of planning wasted! Did she not have a plan B? What else is there? This is when we're formally introduced to Lord Rogers, who's like a conductor or a tutor. He's like Uberta's like gay best friend. But also later they might get married in the sequels. And we don't we don't talk about I consider that non-canon. And Rogers has the best line in the whole movie. You should write a book. How to offend women in five syllables or less. Rogers is the best character in this movie. He is just as tired of Derek's crap as we are. And Derek's like, well, I feel other stuff too, I guess. I'll prove it to her. I'll prove my love. Meanwhile, he's playing chess with Brom. And at one point, Brom is like, you lost your queen, Derek. And Derek does this exaggerated eye roll and says, that's twice in one day. I wrote that down verbatim in my notes. And then I put a little angry face next to it. Oh, Derek. Derek, you and your page boy haircut, your little thigh high boots. What is going on in your life? So one of the things that called this movie to our attention for I Will Fight You is in the previous scene in Arrange the marriage and there's that little thank you but what else is beauty all that matters to you and as well as Odette's little response to her father in our next scene here this was passed around on Tumblr a while back as like oh my gosh this is so progressive and so feminist this is amazing and it ignores the fact that they just had like two giant freaking boners for each other as soon as they got hot not only that but this movie is about the furthest thing from feminist the princess gets turned into a bird and spends the whole movie pining and needing to be rescued and on one notable occasion menaced by her main love interest with arrows and this is this is the thing about this movie is that if you're not looking at all these weird implications and you're under six you are solidly entertained you love it we all loved this when we were little and then once you're about 25 you're able to sort of cool down and say well this is really dumb and some of these implications are bad but my god look at all these teeth and just just keep that in mind as we go forward. So we're in the forest. Uh, yeah, Odette and her and her dad, King William, are in a carriage. Why didn't they have this earlier? Who knows? Are they in Uberta's kingdom? Are they in his kingdom? Did they not take the boat? Are they riding back to their own kingdom? Can you get there in a day? I'm going to be really bothered by where this is in like a couple of minutes. And then Jack Palant sticks his head around a tree and says, today's the day, Willie. Well, like in the carriage, William's like, I just don't understand. What else did you want him to say? I don't know, King William. Maybe something other than, oh, well, look, you're hot and boner towns are happening right now. Which is pretty much what just happened. Verbatim, I think. And Odette's like, I need to know that he loves me for just being me. And we're gonna try to come back to this line later and it is not gonna stick. And Rothbart, Rothbart is now a big ass bat thing. Rothbart turned into a bat and it's not even really a bat. So the Swan Princess wiki describes the great animal as like having the head of a fox and the body of a bat and the legs of a lion. I, I don't know. I don't think. 
I, I don't know what their source is, and I don't think it's legitimate. No, it's just someone was really bad at drawing bats. So what do bats look like? They got great big wolf heads and eagle talons on them, right? And like translucent wings, right? With green membranes. So a soldier barges into Uberta's castle. Apparently, you can go directly outside from the room where Bromley and Derek and, and Rogers were just hanging out, which doesn't seem quite right, but here we go. Derek is like, Odette's in trouble! And also William, I guess, but Odette! And he leaps on his horse and charges out into the wilderness. He catches up to them pretty quick. This is within a horse ride of the spot. Everything's basically destroyed and King William's almost lying dead on the ground. I also want to point out that the captain left theoretically while William was still alive. The bat attacked and he just booked it out of there. Oh my god, you're right. I wrote down what King William says because okay. it makes me so mad. Okay, so to preface this before Matt goes into this, William is dying. He has to relay as much information as possible about what has happened. And while Derek is sort of pawing at him and being like, Oh, Dad! A great animal. Listen to me, Derek. It is not what it seems. It's not what it seems. Where is Odette? Odette is. Odette is. Gone. And then he dies. And then he's like, oh, gross, dead body. Odette! Howls Odette into the night. Okay, these are his last words. These are King William's last words. Let's break this shit down. A great animal. Listen to me, Derek. It is not what it seems. It's not what it seems. Odette is... Odette is gone. Let's isolate it's not what it seems. Because this is a phrase that Derek latches on to for the rest of this movie. It's not what it seems. It's not what it seems. We have five syllables here. If you were dying and you were trying to explain what the hell you just meant by a great animal, and you're going to pick it's not what it seems in order to relay the most crucial pieces of information. You can do this with the same amount of syllables to say the wizard's a bat. Five syllables. You've just relayed so much more information. You could even shave this down by one and say Rothbart's a bat. Suddenly they know their villain? Suddenly they know what they're looking for. It's not what it seems. Oh, dad! So the next scene transition is suddenly gorgeous matte paintings. Most of the backgrounds in this movie are gorgeous. Like, it's so- this movie's backgrounds are so pretty, and then they just throw Derek and his teeth onto them. The great thing about Derek is you can freeze frame at any point on his face, and you can laugh. We have- we have done this. Derek is never on model. We don't know what his model looks like, because he never looks the same from one frame to the next. So, it's a ruined castle, and a lake, and there's a pretty waterfall. And then we have Rothbart. And he's Jack Palancing all over a swan. Well, there's a hag next to him throwing birdseed at a swan. This hag, by the way, has no name. She will not have a name until the sequels when they name her Bridget. She's also basically mute except for cackling and making like weird noises and saying one more time once. And then it, it gets even weirder because when she talks in the sequel, she speaks in broken English and refers to herself in the third person. Oh, and this is our Odile, everybody. This hag is our Odile. So anyway. Basically, uh, Rothbart starts talking to Odette, who is the swan. And then he's like, if you'd only marry me, you wouldn't be in this situation. And he explains what the situation is, which is that Odette is going to be a swan all day, except when moonlight hits the lake or moonlight hits her wings, it kind of changes around, and then she goes through really pretty animation and turns into herself again. In the lake that is evidently one inch deep. When I got the DVD, there's a read-along book, Teach Children How to Read, by telling you the backstories of the animal companions that are in this film. And there's animal companions. There's animal companions up the ass. And in one of them, I'm pretty sure... Hmm, is it Speed? I think it's Speed's. I'm pretty sure it's Puffin, because Puffin's backstory is... It is off the frickin' wall. And, um, but in the middle of this, so that's the one telling these stories for reasons unknown. And Odette's like, and then Puffin showed up to help me with my evil Uncle Rothbart. And we're watching this and I'm like, hold on. Evil Uncle Rothbart. In this movie, Rothbart wants to stick his dick in the swan. Rothbart wants to marry Odette to have legal rights over the kingdom. This portrayal of royal marriage politics is a little too accurate for a children's movie. Best I can figure is somebody like basically remembered what the plot of Swan Princess was and the voice actress for Odette vaguely remembered what the plot of the Swan Princess was. So they just sort of ran through this line as she read it aloud and it was like no big is for like a DVD extra for children. No one's gonna care about this. All of this aside, this uncle thing seems to be non-canon in, in the loose canon of the Swan Princess. As we were saying, Rothbart wants Odette's kingdom. She's like, take it then. You have enough power. Odette. Odette. 
Odette, sweetie, maybe be just a little concerned about your kingdom and the people that live there. Just, just a little. Just a little. Aside from this plot point, we never hear from Odette's kingdom again. No, we're pretty much just concerned about Derek's kingdom and Derek and Derek and Derek and Derek and his teeth. Rothbart also, like, in order to demonstrate this marriage thing, he also magics up this, like, horrifically 90s wedding dress. It's got little swan wings on it. It's got, like, a little, like, white tiara. It's really bad. Odette still refuses, of course, because she's our protagonist. So, some unspecified time later, we are back at Uberta's castle. Okay, so my note for this just says abusive musicians with dummy arrows. It's it's pretty much the worst song in the movie, too. Yeah, the song is something like practice, practice, practice. It's got like five words in it. Also, what's basically happening here, it's the most dangerous game, but with silly outfits and non-lethal weapons. We are a band and not a band of animals. This masquerade is more than I can bear. It's a whole fucking song of shitty animal puns. Yeah, since the servants have the day off, all of them have the same day off for some reason. The musicians are going to be serving as target practice for Derek while he works. I don't, I'm not sure. Apparently he's the best marksman in the kingdom, but he needs to practice on musicians anyway. Which you think would come up maybe sometime during this little, like, establishing character song in the beginning. But this is simply a fact that is thrown at us. It turns out everybody thinks Odette is dead. What happened to her kingdom? William's dead. Odette's dead. Considering Uberta's, like, terror at maybe seeing Odette later, I think Uberta annexed the kingdom. I think she was determined to not have all those years of planning go to waste. So when the royal family completely died off, she's like, I own you now. Well, my son was going to marry your princess, so let's just say that he did. No one in William's kingdom knows that Derek and Odette called off the marriage. It's only the people in Uberta's kingdom who know this. And hey, they all want lower taxes. There's a really, really terrifying line during this entire sequence of them firing dummy arrows at musicians dressed up like animals. And the line is, if we refused, he would have sacked us, so we resign ourselves to lives of target practice. That's horrifying. That's awful! Derek also bleats out at some point, the great animal's never gonna give her up without a fight. Whatever the hell that means. And the thing is that this song is like, it's maybe a couple of lines, and then we have some, like, god-awful animal puns and antics, and then we do more song, and then more antics, and then songs and antics together. And at one point, the musicians do note that if they refused, they would have been sacked and, you know, lost all their money, and their families would have probably starved to death. This is awful. What a horrible dystopian place this kingdom is. And also we find out during this thing where all these people as animals are, are assigned different points for how valuable they are. The rabbit is worth 100 points and a lion is worth about 20. I'm not sure a rabbit is more valuable in hunting than a lion. I think a rabbit might be a little bit easier to take out. Rabbits are small and quick, Annie. Haven't you ever played a, like, shoot 'em game at an arcade? The small and quick things are worth more points because they're harder to hit. It's also, um, the guy playing the white rabbit in this shoot 'em up game is basically Bugs Bunny. He's a little chubby Bugs Bunny without any, like, wit. So, after this whole humiliating, most dangerous game thing is over, it turns out Derek beat up a bunch of musicians and they're probably gonna have a lot of bruises. And also he won the shooting competition. Yeah. Uh, Bromley tries to cheat by, like, tapping the rabbit three times with his thing, but Derek actually hit the rabbit, uh, right on the rabbit's butthole. There's no nice way to say this. He, he hit the rabbit right in the butthole. This is demeaning to say the least. So what better way to follow this up than to play another training game that involves reckless endangerment and uh, lack of care for human life. Catch and fire! This is the worst, most dangerous game I've ever heard of and no wonder Derek is good at it. And Brom is just, he is terrified for both his own life and because he is being told to shoot his best friend and liege lord in the heart. If Bromley succeeds here in somehow shooting Derek in the heart like Derek misses and Bromley does hit him in the heart, Bromley's going to be killed for treason. Instead of actually killing anybody, what happens is that Bromley fires the arrow. It's worth noting that neither Derek nor Bromley at any point in this movie seem to know how to actually hold a bow correctly. Bromley shoots the arrow. Derek catches it and shoots the arrow back at Bromley at the apple at his head. It's a Hawkeye thing. And you will not believe that this is plot relevant. So, after we establish that little thing, back at Swan Lake Castle, it's nighttime, and it's also time to meet the worst animal sidekicks. And we're hearing French music because one of them's a frog. 
It's John Cleese doing a terrible French accent as a frog named Jean Bob. An actual comedian Stephen Wright as Dime Store TV's Garfield voice as Speed the Turtle. I also want to point out that later we find out that Speed's full name is Lorenzo Trudgealong. And the next pet that I adopt, I might need to name Mr. Lorenzo Trudgealong. What a name! It's so good! I love it, unironically! Anyway, we focus on John Bob's C or D plot for the whole movie, which is that John Bob is convinced that he's a prince who's been transformed into a frog and needs a princess's kiss to turn back. And to do this, he's fixated on Odette to a terrifying degree. So, in this little wacky gag, he's gonna, like, vault over the moat to the castle to get some flowers so Odette'll kiss him, and we're also introduced to our very, very minor antagonists for the animal sidekicks, which is the big lipped alligator from All Dogs Go to Heaven and his generic friend. No joke. This is straight up a trace of the big lipped alligator from All Dogs Go to Heaven. I don't know why that's here. No joke. So Odette saves him from his own stupidity. And so can Odette talk to the animals or are these talking animals? The animals never talk to anyone else, which lends me to believe that Odette can just talk to animals. And it doesn't seem like Odette as a swan can talk to people. So she just has like animal speech as a side effect of being a swan sometimes. Well, apparently that gets thrown out the window in the sequels. Everything gets thrown out the window in the sequels. Including the 2D budget for the last two movies. It's all CGI. Google image search swan princess CGI and scream. It's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. Derek looks even worse. I'm not the kind of person to say that CGI is inherently better or worse than 2D animation, but this is. So Odette saves him and John bobs like, give me a kiss. And she says, don't you know I'm under a curse? I can only kiss the man I love, and he must make a vow of everlasting love and prove it to the world. This was never explained to Odette on screen. For all we know, she's making this up. She could be making this up from whole cloth just to get the frog to stop being sexually aggressive. That's a hell of a sentence. And just to try and move past that moment, Odette suddenly breaks into a freaking song. This is like our key song for this movie. It is far longer than forever. It's our love song between Odette and Derek. And it's also the song that over the credits will get turned into a 90s power ballad. It's incredibly overproduced. It's incredibly overwrought. As they're singing far longer than forever, I always thought for the longest time that it was for longer than forever. But no, it's far longer than forever. They just don't enunciate. And they do this weird thing where it's cut down the middle and they've got Derek in like his castle on one side and Odette like singing it to the heavens on the other side. And it looks like they smudged the line between the two animation cells with, like, Vaseline. Yeah. And also there's the fact that, you know, Derek at least has had time to process this, but the last time Odette saw Derek, he told her that he only valued her for her beauty. But she's totally gone on him. She is over the freaking moon about this, like, schmoopy teeth man with his thigh-high boots. I can't get over those stupid thigh-high boots. They look awful. They look awful on him! They look awful on everybody, but especially him. He's basically a triangle with two stick legs and thigh-high boots sticking out of it. And those little shoulder things. He's got, like, leather shoulder fringe. It's it's just this awful song. It's this awful song. Everything about it is awful. The lyrics are... I can't even remember any of the lyrics. It's that generic. I can. I like the way you said that as a threat. Please don't. For one thing, we don't have the rights. So instead, how about something even more awkward and bad? Because, oh shit, here comes Puffin. And by golly, does he have an accent. He has an accent. We're not sure what accent it is, but it's there. It might be Scottish. It might be Irish. We're not totally sure. Lieutenant Puffin. In what army? We just don't know. In Puffin's backstory, he learns karate from a Japanese emperor. Puffin knows karate, and he says awful irritating things, and he adds sound effects to his speech. He swaps out sound effects instead of just saying words. It doesn't get old at all. The weirdest thing is, is that six-year-old me f***ing loved Puffin. I was such a big fan of Puffin. I don't know why. I love Jean Bob. Is this like a Jar Jar Binks thing where you look back on and you go, wait, that character was awful. Maybe. I mean, in this movie, especially from like the sort of swan princess side of the whole thing, Puffin is definitely the most active character. So maybe we were attracted to that. I also want to point out, Odette refers to Speed and John Bob as her two best friends in the whole wide world. Oh, honey, your life is awful. We don't know if she had any friends besides Derek when she was a kid. And do you think William would have, like, isolated her so the only person that she talked to or knew was Derek? That's awful. 
And now her only friends are a frog and a tortoise that thinks he's a turtle. This is the worst. She has the worst social circle. The only thing that interrupts all these awful animals meeting each other and talking and explaining about, like, a curse is Rothbart wanders in. Rothbart is here to impress Odette with his magic again, and I swear to God, like, the voice he uses, especially in this scene, is, like, so... I'm so hard right now. Like, oh, Odette. And Odette is again, like, every night, you come and do this weird shit. And every night, I say, I don't want to marry you. And Rothbard's like, you're really starting to bug me. Anyway, swan time. Swan time, and it's a full moon for those of you playing along at home. And of course, since we just finished up a swan plot, we have to switch back to the Castle of Teeth. So back at the castle, Uberta, and by the way, I think this adds to our Uberta surreptitiously took over William's Kingdom thing, because Uberta is in a room full of crowns. Where did she get all of these? Are these from all the kingdoms she's conquered? She's even holding a crown that looks kind of similar to William's. And she's like, Derek's going to get married and he'll forget all about Odette. There's a party tomorrow night. And the horrible little gremlin shows up again. Yeah, he's got a whole bunch of RSVPs. Rogers think Derek's probably won't go for this little party thing. And I just have a, a note written right below Rogers that just says TEETH in all caps again. You know, Rogers is so weird to me because when you, like, put him against other characters, I swear to God, it's like his chief animator had a different idea for what this movie was supposed to look like than anybody else. Rogers has all these extra lines. He's got all these cartoony proportions. I swear his inks are thinner than everybody else. Else's, and there's those individually drawn teeth. It's like his chief animator was just a freaking horrible maverick. He doesn't look like he belongs in the same movie as everybody else. No, he doesn't. But he's here, and he has some of the best lines, so he can stay. Meanwhile, in Beauty and the Beast library. Best library ever, oh my god. Derek is diving around and pulling out books, talking about the great animal. Infuriating the librarian. And then he uh, suddenly pulls one out and um, looks at it in the middle of it, and he goes, This is it! The great animal! It's not what it seems! Of course! He starts flipping two pages back and forth. It turns out later that he has, like, ripped these pages out of this book. Yeah, the librarian is so mad. The librarian must hate him so much. What the f*** is wrong with you, Derek? Uberta charges in and reminds Derek that there's a ball tomorrow night, and Derek's like, I can't make it because I have to go the great animal. Uberta's like, nah. Derek says, okay, but don't make it one of your beauty pageants. Has she had many of these? This must be a regular thing because by God, they've got it rehearsed. You think it's a metaphor or like some kind of exaggeration as though it's like a beauty pageant? And then princesses on parade happens. So back at the lake. Puffin actually points out a really good idea, which is, hey, why don't you go and get Derek and bring him here and then turn into a lady? Puffin has the smartest ideas and it's awful because it's encased in these horrific gargling's that come out of his mouth. And uh, this is, I think, when we get the song No Fear. Yeah, it is. I know you said Far Longer Than Forever is the worst, but I think No Fear is the worst for me. I love them all, even if I kind of hate Far Longer Than Forever. Honestly, I can't accurately assess whether No Fear is a bad song because I keep getting distracted by the fact that this movie thinks swans can hover. This is a song that is Odette and, like, the animal trio. This is them looking for a map, and they're flying around looking for the map, and when they find it, Odette is just gonna, like, be on the sidelines while the wacky animal sidekicks try to get the map from the hag, and there's, like, a five to seven minute sports gag montage. Also, we find out in this sequence that Rothbart has an entire book of swan spells. It's literally called Swan Spells. How many are there? I would love the idea of at least 25 different swan spells. He is a specialist in swan spells. I could just imagine him trying to figure out what to do with Odette. He's in that library. He's walking up and down the shelves and suddenly he sees it up on the topmost shelf and there's like, Finally, finally, this is the day he gets to use the Book of Swan Spells. And then he's leaving through it, and it's kind of like when you get a cookbook, and you pull out the cookbook before you decide to what to make that night. And he can't really decide, so you just kind of leaf through him like, I don't know. Am I feeling turn her into the attitude of a swan, or do I want her to just be a swan? Do I want her to be a lady sometimes? I don't know. I, I just kind of... I just kind of want to go out for burgers. So the sports montage is like, it's football, then it turns into tennis, then it turns back into football, then it's baseball, and then it turns into hockey, and I think it turns into luging at the end. 
And then they get the map, and that's, like, the only thing that happens. And it's a long-ass song, and it's supposed to be wacky, and I hate it. The sequence is, like, five times longer than it needs to be. And that's that's really kind of the whole thing about this movie. Everything about this movie is much longer than it needs to be. Especially considering it took four years to make, because they were hand-painting every cell. And then it got clobbered at the box office anyway by Star Trek Generations and the re-release of The Lion King. So, back to Derek. He and Bromley are prepping for hunting. Derek tore the pages out of the book, and it shows a mouse turning into a dragon. Well, it doesn't even show that. He tore a page out with a dragon on it. He tore a page out with a mouse on it. And he just kind of flips back and forth. It's like a really bad flip book. It's like the fliparama bits from Captain Underpants. And he says the great animal can apparently change shape into any animal. How does this give them the edge? How does he say, today's the day, I'm gonna go look for any animal? He comes to this conclusion out of nowhere, and it just basically sets up the dumbest conflict in this entire movie. I think Derek Hunt's and his plan to look for the great animal is to do the thing that you do in the Oregon Trail, which is just to kill everything that crosses your path. But you can only take 200 pounds back to the wagon. We intercut this with a bit of Puffin and Odette who are going to go fly out and try to find Derek and Speed and Jean Bob are just going to like hang out, I guess. Yeah, they they apparently have a role in this plan, but the only role we see them having is when Jean Bob grabs a couple of fireflies and waves them in like they're on a runway in an airport. Like they couldn't find the fucking lake. Then we cut back to the forest where Derek and Bromley are looking for the animal. Again, gorgeous backgrounds. And it's a wild place, so Bromley almost kills a mouse and is also terrified by various insects and vermin. I swear I think I heard a kookaburra in here somewhere. And meanwhile, Derek's like, he's in here, Brom, I can feel it. And I'm pretty sure he's 100% wrong. And he actually is. Because then he sees a swan and he's like, oh, a swan, of course. It's not what it seems. I have to kill the swan. This is like the only movie I've ever seen, the only kids movie I've ever seen, where the Disney prince is a jump scare. And it goes to this whole overly elaborate scene of Derek chasing Odette, and she's like, he's the greatest hunter in the world! He's faster than he looks! And Derek almost kills them like three or four times. This is a messed up movie! But it's okay, because boners are about to come back in full force, because then he gets lured to Swan Lake. Today it's a crescent moon, for those of you playing along at home. There's this pointless tension moment. Oh no, there were clouds. There are clouds in front of the moon. Odette can't transform because clouds. And so Derek's about to kill her and Puffin headbutts him. And then that like brief, absolutely momentary distraction, the clouds just rush away and we go through our stock transformation. It is the prettiest animation in this whole movie. I, I just have a line in my notes that says Derek and Odette teeth at each other. Again, this lake is one inch deep. Either that or they can both walk on water. Rothmark comes along and Odette pushes him away while babbling about the vow of everlasting love and prove it to the world. And Derek's like, of course, I'm having a party. Come to the ball tomorrow night. And then Rothbart's here again. And to distract him, Odette is like, you know what? I've decided I'll marry you. Yeah, what was what was her end game there? I do not know, but Rothbart like, goes through this whole thing where he's like effusively, oh my god, yes, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm gonna get my beard trimmed. This is gonna be wonderful. I'll make you the happiest woman in the world. And also I found Derek's bow and I know you're lying. It's actually kind of great. He cartoonishly pulls it out from under his cloak. It's like Bugs Bunny hammer space in there. And Odette's like, I will marry Prince Derek and you cannot stop me. And it's like, he's a wizard. I think he maybe has a swan related spell to stop you. Uh, but Rothbard, apparently, the ridiculous passage of time is on his side because he says, Tomorrow night, there's no moon. And then Odette starts pretty crying. Because that's that's what Disney princesses do best. It's too bad she doesn't have a bed to throw herself on dramatically. No, she could do it on the lake, but it wouldn't have the same effect. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining, though. Oh, oh, ploosh! Here comes Rothbart with his musical number. No more Mr. Nice Guy. You might think it's going to be a really good rock song, but it's not. Rothbart basically makes the plan that he is going to turn the hag into Odette in a sexy black dress and uh, have Derek make the vow to the wrong princess or something, and somehow that'll make Odette die. It's... Yeah, in Swan Lake, the idea is that Odette feels so betrayed that she basically starts to die of grief, which is a thing that can happen in ballet. But here, it just makes no sense. Right, which is, again, this is why our hag is Odile for some reason. So this No More Mr. Nice Guy song. The best I can figure is that this movie saw Aladdin, which came out two years earlier, saw 
friend like me and said, oh my god, let's do that, with a line that goes, I intend to eat their lunches. It's just Rothbard deciding that, you know what, all nuance of his characterization is out the window now. He's just going to be cartoonishly evil for no reason. More so than usual. He doesn't even want to rule the kingdom anymore. He just wants Odette to die and to mess with Derek. There's also this weird part where, like, throughout this whole fantasy, he creates the gremlin, incidentally, and uh, the hag really thinks the gremlin is hot and wants to kiss him. This is a doke? Ha ha ha. Rothbart also in the middle of the song says so much for politically correct and oh my god, is Rothbart like a gamer gator on Reddit? Anyway, back at the Castle of Teeth, Derek is super obsessed with swans now. It's really awkward. He's like, no, I want white roses like a swan. I want appetizers a swan would eat. You need to play instruments like a swan. If you could play a swan, what would it sound like? And you know what it would probably sound like? Not an instrumentation of for longer than forever, which is what ends up happening. But it would probably just sound like... <laughs> And then the sound of your bone snapping as you get smacked with its wings. And the instruments would just start, like, attacking each other, because swans are dicks. So, uh, Derek, while he's at it, also tells his mom that he's picked a lucky lady, and Hubert is overjoyed, and he's like, you'll, you'll let me know who it is? And it's like, oh, y'all know. It's really menacing. He also is like, dance dips her hair into a bowl of punch slash wine. Which I guess is a joke. Is that funny? Is it just annoying? We just don't know. Rothbart puts Odette in the bottom of a dungeon where she can't like fly up or swim out or something. And it's a dungeon with water in it because of course. And my favorite line in this whole fucking movie happens. Oh, now you're mad at me again, dog. Gonna can't do nothing right. Head full of pudding. Head full of pudding. Head full of pudding. Head full of pudding. Anyway, speaking of heads full of pudding, Rothbard has also captured Bromley. You remember that character we forgot about? Yeah, here he is. He's here to. I bet. I bet you can't possibly guess what his only point is going to be in being here. Spoilers. Hawkeye. Bromley gets thrown into the dungeon. So the princesses for this quote-unquote beauty pageant have all arrived at Uberta's castle. And there's this, like, weird mini song by this, like, quartet about how, like, everybody wants to be at this party. And the weird thing is that this song isn't even a minute long, which is great because we're used to gem songs on this podcast. But also, the song isn't even, like, listed as its own song on the album, so I have no idea what this is. It's just part of Princesses on Parade, for reasons unknown. Right before we get to that, though, you'd think it was time for a wacky animal rescue, but it's not. It's just time for a verse of no fear from the animals. So we get a pointless scene that says, we're gonna do a thing. And then it's freaking time. It's time for princesses on motherfucking parade. You remember no beauty pageants? It turns out it's a beauty pageant. Because Uberta was a beauty pageant contestant back in 39? I don't want to know what, what numbers precede 39. The gremlin is singing the beauty pageant song. And oh boy, does he have a deep voice. I don't know what the general songs are for, like, Miss America. All I have is Miss Congeniality. So this guy is basically just William Shatner going, She's beauty and she's grace. She's Miss United States. And there's so much glitter. Oh my god, it's it's just glitter up the ass. Let's run through our princesses that are actually presented to us that don't seem to be the princesses that are actually singing the song. We've got Corn Princess. We've got someone named Antonia. We've got Griselda, a Russian princess. And then we have Brunhilda, who actually has metal riveted onto her face. Mary Brunhilda! Brunhilda is the best here. And then the song just sort of keeps happening after that. There's like male dancers who just sort of float in and out, and it's all about how Derek is going to fall in love with one of them, and the song just keeps going and happening. Every time you think this is going to be over, it's not. And then there's a knock on the door and the Chamberlain dies inside. He's horrified that he forgot a guest, I guess, to the point where it's like he thinks he's actually going to die. I think Uberta might actually kill him. There is this unspeakable tension between Uberta and the Gremlin. The whole room is tense. The whole room is like, there was a knock on the door. We were unprepared for this eventuality. Who else is here? The door opens. It's not the milkman. And everybody is rendered stunned and silent. It's Odile, but it's the hag is Odette, so let's just call her Odette. It's Odette. Nobody recognizes her at all. The whole room is silent. Those who seem to recognize her are utterly devastated by this. 
Uberta is like, oh no, it can't be. The only way that Uberta could be this horrified and unbelieving by Odette, a princess presumed dead, walking in, would be if she had usurped William's kingdom. And she's like, oh great, the actual heir to the throne just showed up. Shit, shit, shit. And Derek and Odette start their Cinderella ball dance again. And then a wacky animal rescue happens. So Speed is going to distract the alligators while jean Bob tries to find the hole that the water is coming into the dungeon through. And then they're going to make the hole wider so Odette can escape. This all takes so f***ing long. There's the big looked alligator, there's the other alligator, there's things that I think are supposed to be jokes. Long story short, Odette gets out and she tries to get Bromley out, but he isn't going for it because he thinks, rightly so, that a swan grabbing at his clothes is maybe going to attack him. Swans are horrible. Like, of all animals to turn somebody into, why a swan? A swan can f*** you up. Look, swan spells. He's been holding on to that thing for years. So back at the ball, Odette has flown off and she's arrived outside the castle windows and she's gonna try and, like, warn Derek that the Odette in there is not the real Odette. But this castle is swan-proof. <laughs> this castle has been painstakingly swan-proofed. All right, I wrote down Derek's line verbatim. Can I can I hit you guys with Derek's little speech? Today I have found my bride. I present her to you as the future queen of our fair kingdom. And as proof of my love for her, I make a vow to break all vows. A vow stronger than all the powers of the earth. Before you and before the whole world, I make a vow of everlasting love to Odette. So people know what a vow of everlasting love is? This is a normal thing that happens, apparently. In the ballet, it's just, I'm gonna get married to you. But even better is that the moment he says to Odette, Odette's like, Derek, no! But because she's a swan, and this is not a movie with talking animals, it probably came out like, honk! So here's the thing, he gestures to the woman that he thinks is Odette, but he names her. It's not like he's saying, I'm making a vow to this woman standing next to me. He's explicitly talking about Odette. So how does this not work? How detail-obsessed is this curse? This curse is really obtuse. So Rothbart breaks in, and to remind us of how terrible he is now, he starts singing a bar of No More Mr. Nice Guy. I made a vow! A vow of everlasting love! And then Rothbart snaps back with, You made a vow, all right! A vow of everlasting... Wait for it. DEATH! As opposed to, you know, the temporary kind. Because, like, Odette turns back into the hag. Real Odette is apparently gonna die in something. And I just, I love this. I love this avow of everlasting death. Like, he's been sitting on that one for a while. He's been working on that line all the way here. But yeah, now Odette's gonna die because the swan curse has too many moving parts. Derek, again, ignoring everyone else in his pursuit for Odette. He chases a swan across the country on a horse. It takes him, like, maybe ten minutes, maybe a half hour at the most, to get to the lake from his castle. Whenever she went missing, how come they didn't search this area if it's, like, ten minutes from his castle? They were like, we searched everywhere for Odette. Let's not search the evil castle. This is a silly place. I mean, Odette probably could have recognized the mountain ranges around her. She probably could have recognized the geography to figure out where she probably was, but she had no freaking clue. That's because her whole brain's trapped in a swan. Let's not even get into matter transfer. All right. Okay, okay, okay. So first off, uh, we have a quick bit of Bromley like breaking out of the dungeon, but that's not important because Odette dives down, turns back into a lady as she's dying. Derek arrives and he teeths over her while they're sad for longer than forever music happening. Sad piano key song. Do, 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 do. Odette's still alive a little bit. She's like, Derek, I love you for some reason. Derek's like, Jeez. Oh. Then she, I guess, dies. I, it's not really clear if she's actually dead or not, but Derek takes that as a cue to shake his fist at the heavens. I made the vow for her. Do you hear me? The vow I made was for her! He just howls it to the heavens. The vow I made was for her! Not gonna lie, that is the part of the movie that I quote most often. <laughs> You can't hear that and not laugh. 
I crack up. I've seen I've seen this movie now three times as an adult, and I've cracked up every time. I can't keep a straight face. Rothbart's back now, and he and Derek are gonna fight. Rothbart finally turns into the great animal, which is like a big dumb bat version of Maleficent as a dragon. Note for note, it's the Maleficent fight. The bat breaks his sword. There's this tiny bit where Puffin's like, Sean, Bob, go get the bow at the bottom of the lake, even though all of us can swim and you can carry the least. And uh, as they pull it up, everything looks like hope is lost, etc., etc. And Bromley appears and he's quivering and he pulls back his bow and shoots an arrow at Derek. And catch and release happens. He shoots it at the bat and the bat dies. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The bat doesn't die. The bat explodes into light. He shoots an arrow at the bat, it embeds somewhere in the bat's chest, probably not its heart, and the bat explodes. It goes nuclear. And then we have our sad Odette no scene. Forgive me, Odette. I only wanted to break the spell to prove my love. I love you for your kindness and your courage. I always have. This is supposed to be like our actual why I love you thing as opposed to what else is there, but it doesn't really. Yeah, no, you love her kindness and courage, which haven't been on display at all in the movie, or do you love her for her obvious cleverness and her tendency to kick your ass? Oh, Derek! She comes back to life and she bleats out an Oreo. And then we're at a wedding. And oh god, it's the swan dress again. They didn't want to design two wedding dresses for this movie. So we've got Odette in this in this tragic swan dress. And this this reminds me of something. When uh when Derek was really excited about this whole like swan theme that he wanted for this ball, did he not think that maybe designing everything in the object of Odette's persecution and torment might be a little inappropriate? Bad form, Derek. Bad form. And then it gets worse because they've moved into the evil castle. Yeah, sure. This place where I was imprisoned and my bodily autonomy taken away from me for God knows how long. Sure, let's live there now. Yeah, I can be reminded of it every day, especially now that the hag is apparently my maid of honor. And then it gets even worse because it's post-wedding and sexually aggressive frog is here. Yeah, at the reception, there's this whole thing where we wrap up our little plot finally. Odette kisses Jean Bob and nothing happens. But Jean Bob thinks it is. What's incredible is that Jean Bob is going to not drop this whole kiss turn me into a prince thing in the rest of the movies so can you imagine how crestfallen he is after he realizes that it didn't work like he is a sexually aggressive frog but also that must be awful so then derek and odette like wander away from the party giggling and then we have our we have our last line will you love me derek till the day i die no much longer than that odette much longer. And by the way, they're over on the lake, which is now instead of an animated lake. It's footage of a lake with a matte painting laid over top. So what happens is we freeze frame on the couple and oh god, they're painted as static and it's weird perspective and we pull back and it's it's a matte painting of a lake with a little hole cut in it for some stock footage of water moving. And then we get the key song again. You guys may not remember, you listeners, you may not quite recall, but it will all come rushing back to you. Then in the 90s, we had this thing where we took like the key, usually the romantic song, and we had a couple of pop stars record it in hopes that it would get on the radio. It worked for whole new world it it actually worked a bit for pocahontas later on with colors of the wind and of course elton john was backing the lion king so i mean it was kind of a foregone conclusion but they did it in this movie and you may have thought far longer than forever was awful to begin with and now it's like far longer than forever Dragging every note along, kicking and screaming. Oh, God. And and then, like, that takes us out. And the, I want to point out there's a bit in the credits where they thank all the banks that they got loans from so they could finish this movie. And then there's, like, a second 90s power ballad that didn't show up in the rest of the movie. Yeah, what the hell was that song? It's called, like, Eternity or something like that. Maybe it was a cut song, like, they didn't finish the sequence for it. Like, they needed two romance songs. But it's awful. So, normally in a podcast like this, this is the point where we have our final thoughts. But this is I Will Fight You, where we only have cold hard facts. So, Mac, final facts about the Swan Princess. Rogers is the greatest character. You can only enjoy this movie when you're under six and over 25. And it has some of the greatest lines in animation history. Because the vow I made was for her. Kit. Fact number one, nobody misses VHS. Fact number two, you would think individually rendered teeth would be horrifying, 
but it's worse when you see them all in one enormous white block in a mouth of a character that never closes. Fact number three, most of the actors in this movie are way too good for this movie. And from me, fact number one, swan-proof castles are bad for you. Fact number two, if you are between the ages of six and 25, the greatness of this movie will completely go over your head and we apologize for that. Fact number three, if a woman comes up to you and she has metal riveted onto her face and she's also riding a horse completely covered in metal and she says, I want to marry you, you marry her because she will have more personality than whatever the hell happened to Odette after she hit puberty. And that, I think, is where the facts stand on I Will Fight You. I Will Fight You is currently coming out on a approximately six-week release schedule. We are regularly, of course, the Gem Jam. You can find us every Sunday on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube, where we review the Gem and the Holograms cartoon from the 80s, because it is truly outrageous. So until next time, friends, I'm Annie. I'm Kit. And I'm Mac. And we have fought you. Oh.